Uh, we're going to get started. Um, we are going to be talking today about scaling Argo security and multi-tenancy in AWS, EKS, uh, and we are from the New York Times. Uh, so my name is Dave Grisanti. Uh, I'm a principal engineer at the Times. And I'm Luke Phillips, a staff engineer with the New York Times. And uh, at the Times, uh, our mission is to build the essential subscription bundle for every English-speaking curious person who seeks to understand and engage with the world. Uh, we're a digital-first experience, leaning into technology to produce con comprehensive news coverage. As an example, um, what being shown behind me of our co coverage of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Uh, and this particular story used machine learning to take historical records and create 3D spaces that you know, are being mapped on screen. You know, this specific story used a variety of microservices and data architecture to be able to map our news stories to this dynamic digital presentation. And this is just one example of uh, things that the Times was trying to do to advance our storytelling and visual capabilities uh, and you know, build more comprehensive products. So today we're gonna go over why we're building an internal developer platform at the Times, what Luke and I specifically work on within that, within that team, uh, how we're doing continuous delivery with Argo, an overview of multi-tenancy Argo architectures, how we're running Argo at the Times, some scaling challenges we faced, and some lessons learned. So I think for most people, what you may be familiar with at the Times is the news coverage. Uh, I'm sure people are familiar with Wordle, though, as well. Um, so there's a lot of other products within the Times kind of scope, right? Games, crossword, Wordle. Uh, but we also have a you know, very vibrant cooking website. Uh, the other platforms, Wirecutter and The Athletic, are also Times brands. And there's also a growing um, audio presence, too, with podcasting and, and a few other things. So there's a lot of you know, development and engineers at the Times who are building these, building these products and teams like ours that are supporting those engineers. So if you were a, you know, an engineer at the Times, application developer, you know, we really want you focusing on developing, developing software, developing stories, like the visual one we showed you up there. But increasingly, developers are being tasked with doing a lot more than just develop as you know, things quote unquote shift left. And they're responsible for you know, containerizing their applications, doing CI CD, building them, testing them, dealing with uh, ingress routing, monitoring, and their lives have just gotten a lot more complicated. So part of what we're trying to do is pull back on some of that complexity so they can focus on uh, you know, making their lives easier and also letting them get back to adding value for customers. And in addition to the developers, we also have you know, folks in more of a DevOps SRE role that are responsible for running maybe Kubernetes platforms that these teams are deploying on now. And we kind of see a mix of how this may have worked in the past. You know, maybe they're using a cloud provider uh, to run something, but they might be running their own clusters one versus two. Um, everybody kind of was doing it you know, differently, uh, depending on the team. So what we really want to do is consolidate all of that down to a shared platform so feature teams could deploy their applications and not worry about you know, managing and maintaining and updating these. And this is really where our team, the delivery engineering team, comes in that Luke and I are part of. You know, delivery engineering owns and manages these clusters uh, to allow teams to deploy. They offer distinct multi-tenant spaces within the clusters. And each team um, operates you know, separate from each other and has RBOC and security controls. And if we kind of zoom out, to look at that, the whole big picture of this IDP we're building, we want an NYT engineer to be able to create, you know, kind of onboard to our platform, develop within some type of source control system like GitHub, uh, have CI CD tools to build, test, and deploy to an AWS EKS environment, have some centralized ingress and routing for those applications, and then be able to monitor them. So this is something that, that our larger team, Deliver Engineering, is building. Um, Luke and I specifically kind of land in the uh, earlier parts of the diagram. Uh, some of our colleagues are talking about other pieces of this system, but Argo is really the thing we're here to, to talk about today and uh, you know, why we chose Argo as our CD tool of choice. Uh, so I'm gonna hand it off to Luke uh, to talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Dave, uh, for the background on our developer platform. Uh, given our platform and architecture of orchestrated container workloads, so Kubernetes. Uh, obviously, the emerging best practices for continuous delivery are utilizing GitOps. After evaluating the landscape of tools available, we went with Argo CD. Uh, this helps facilitate our continuous delivery 
and GitOps patterns within our internal developer platform. Uh, some of the realized benefits of an internal developer platform, uh, having an alignment of your software development lifecycle streams, your CI and CD processes become reusable and repeatable. Uh, common tools and patterns, they improve velocity, quality, and support of software services. It allows uh, people like Dave and myself to scale our abilities as well, um, and being that this is ArgoCon, I don't really need to belabor much more the CD benefits. Um, but part of our any discussion about security and scaling requires a review of the deployment architectures and what kind of choices you make around operating Argo CD itself. Um, so we want to give a quick review of uh, some of the published uh, architectures of Argo CD itself and which was just the right size for us. Uh, keep in mind that each example may fit better in your own use case. Um, starting off with a standalone model, each cluster has its own Argo instance. Uh, some of the uh, benefits to this is a reliability of uh, each cluster operates independently, isolation of concerns, better security, distribution of load per cluster. Uh, however, this creates a lot of complexity for management and updates as well as complexity in providing user access. Um, this requires maintaining many instances and duplicating uh, configuration. Uh, so this was not quite the right size for us, but we liked a lot of the security benefits here. Uh, looking at some of the other options, you have your hub and spoke model, a uh, single Argo instance to connect and deploy to many Kubernetes uh, instances. This is easy for management, um, creates a wonderful developer experience, one pane of glass to see all of your deployment applications um, simple disaster recovery and simple access usage. Uh, the challenges, though, is it is a single point of failure. Uh, scaling requires a lot more tuning of the individual components of Argo CD um, and the lack of isolation for security. Uh, so this was getting a lot closer to what we were looking for as far as uh, the developer experience. Um, and finally, uh, one other set of architectures you can consider are Argo instances per group, per logical group, or to split apart the components of Argo itself. Uh, some of the benefits here is a little better load distribution per group, an outage of one cluster won't affect every group, um, and credentials become a little more scoped per group. Uh, however, you still have the challenge of maintaining more instances of Argo and requiring um, a separate management, uh, sort of a separate management cluster. Uh, alternatively, you can split apart the components of Argo CD. Uh, there's an experimental open source project, uh, open cluster management tool that does this. Uh, though also a great uh, credit to some of this review and other architectural solutions that provide a better uh, support around the splitting of components is uh, to check out the Acuity or CodeFresh products. Uh, however, for us, we were looking at just the open source solutions right now. <coughs> Uh, so balancing the various pros and cons of the architectures we were looking at, uh, we really enjoyed the experience of one Argo to rule them all. Uh, we also have some smaller instances of Argo for our own testing and allows us to uh, sort of dynamically balance clusters if we need to. Uh, but right now, kind of one Argo to rule them all. We also balance the trade-offs of our strict security controls with CI governance and policies around our GitOps repos and measured separation of concerns for the various repos of config. Um, I'd also advise you to check out another talk later this week by some of our colleagues that will be going into greater detail about uh, the Git uh, security and policies we use there. Um, and so from here, I'll transition back to Dave, who will uh, go into more detail about how we're using Argo CD in this architecture. Thanks, Luke. So uh, I'm going to jump into Argo at the times, and specifically how we have it deployed and some challenges we faced uh, fitting into our multi-tenant Kubernetes environment. So as Luke pointed out, uh, this is the model that we chose from the kind of available architectures that we kind of surveyed. Um, and, like, and like I mentioned, we're deploying this into a multi-tenant cluster that another team within our department runs that was had some requirements for how Argo operated and, and our security team also wanted it to see it uh, match some of the RBOC controls that were already already there. Uh, so when we kind of set out to use Argo CD, uh, like a lot of people, we went to the docs and you know used kubectl to uh, to apply the manifest um, and you know create namespaces, all that sort of thing. Uh, when we wanted to add a new cluster, um, 
a target cluster, you know, we use the Argo CD CLI to do that. This, from, you know, from our experience, and I think now assumes a certain set of um, control and permissions within the clusters you're installing it in, uh, mostly cluster-wide admin, uh, which we didn't have. Uh, we were kind of operating just like a tenant with limited permissions um, within our, this multi-tenant cluster. So um, when, we, when this, our security team kind of looked at the way that we had installed Argo in the kind of our sandbox POC environment, they kind of raised some red flags. And they were like, you know, you can't install this in the, in the multi-tenant cluster that the tenants are using at, this way. Um, so here's our kind of requirements for you. Um, you won't get any uh, cluster-wide admin access for the Argo installation. Uh, you need to limit what permissions Argo is going to have in the target clusters uh, where users are running their applications down to the same permissions essentially that the, the users would have. And you have no access to install custom CRDs. So like you can't, we're not gonna give you access to install the Argo CRDs. Uh, so from our side, we were you know, contem contemplating how we would do that, what we had to split up, what we had to do ourselves, uh, kind of work with our other team and our department to kind of, to kind of manage all this. Uh, so this, so what we came up with was these kind of three things. So the first one was uh, bring your own RBOC. So we kind of separated the uh, installation of the CRDs and anything that requ require uh, cluster admin uh, to the same workflow that was um, being used to install and set up the Kubernetes cluster in EKS. This allowed us to kind of keep all the CRDs and that, that stuff separate. Um, we customized the Argo CD Helm chart to also separate stuff out. Uh, so we pulled out the pieces that uh, could be run without this admin access. Um, we essentially just did that with like a bash script to circle over the stuff that we needed to separate out and, and uh, use the pieces that we needed. And then the last piece was, and this is the more interesting thing that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about next, was how the, the role of the service account that lives in the target clusters functioned and what permissions it had. And what we, what we separated uh, was, um, you know, the traditional way that's done if you just follow the docs is, it has um, like create, read, update, delete, everything on all namespaces. So we made it so that that cluster-wide role only had essential, you know, essentially read permissions, and then we attached namespace-specific roles that matched what the tenants would have. So it kind of had one service account with a cluster role and then a role per, uh, a role per namespace. So let's dig in a little bit on, on how that, how that, what that looks like and how that works. Uh, so this is kind of a simplified diagram uh, showing the Argo CD lives in its own admin cluster, um, and this kind of operates on, on all of our environments, dev stage prod. Um, it looks at a set of Git repos uh, for um, the project and app files. And on the target clusters, there's that service account I mentioned, and it has the, the cluster um, role that essentially only has read. And then in each namespace, it has a role and a role binding that essentially mimics what a, each tenant is given. So Argo has the same permissions a tenant would over all of the applications um, within that namespace. And this worked out for us uh, better, I think, than we expected in the beginning. We were worried we weren't gonna be able to kind of match the security requirements. So we were, uh, we were able to achieve that. Um, we didn't necessarily love this setup, though, because I think the more research we did, we realized we wanted to lean a little bit more into AWS IAM native um, you know, security versus using a traditional Kubernetes model with you know, a, a service account and a token. Uh, so the next thing we kind of looked at was, could we lean into the AWS IAM model a bit more? Um, and after kind of reading through various AWS docs about um, identity mappings and blogs on Argo and how the kind of two could uh, match, um, this is kind of the, the model that we came up with and wanted to try to achieve. Uh, so this would translate the same cluster and namespace roles that I talked about, but it would remove the need for the service account and the Kubernetes token. Uh, so let's go through how we, how we did this. So just a quick primer on AWS IAM for people who aren't familiar. It's the identity and access management component within AWS, and it just controls who can access what within AWS. So it's kind of their layer of IAM separate from Kubernetes uh, RBOC. So the first thing we needed to do was set up a role, um, which we called Argo CD, and this is what the Argo uh, components within the Argo CD cluster will assume uh, when it needs to talk to another cluster. That role will have two things set up. The first is a trust relationship, and this allows 
the um, Argo CD um, a cluster roles to assume uh, this role via a trust relationship. The next, the next thing, oop, I skipped over one. No? Oh, sorry, I didn't skip one, it's the next slide. Uh, this is uh, doing the patch uh, within Kubernetes to let those um, uh, service accounts assume the role via an annotation. The next thing was the um, IAM policy on that account. And I'll get to why this is important in a second, but this allows this role to assume the role in the target cluster uh, from the AWS side. And if you kind of like think about this as a big picture, we, we set up a role, IAM role, with a trust relationship and a policy. This is something typical you would do with a lot of, if you're creating IAM roles in AWS, but I was just stepping through the three pieces that were needed from the Argo CD uh, operation side. And the next thing is creating the role that this Argo CD role will assume in the target cluster. And this can be done across accounts. So I kind of showed how this can be separated. Um, and the important thing is to look at is just like the, the item in the principle uh, showing that this trust relationship allows the Argo CD role to assume it. And this role won't have any I specific IAM permissions to do anything in AWS. It'll just have a trust relationship which allows that, that Argo CD role to assume it. This is what the uh, cluster role and cluster role bindings look like specifically that I've kind of been mentioning all along. Uh, the one on the left is the uh, tenant level role binding and role that are in the tenant specific namespaces. And the one on the right is si similar to what you would see if you installed Argo CD out of the box for the cluster role, except it only has list and watch. On the cluster, no create, read, or delete permissions. And then to kind of complete the, the circle here, to link the IAM role down to the Kubernetes kind of native RBOC, um, AWS has this uh, concept called identity mapping, which you give it the AWS kind of identity and then the Kubernetes identity. And that's how it uh, does the linking. And then lastly, when you register the target cluster within Argo CD, you just have to do some specific uh, stuff within the configuration to say, this is the role I want you to assume um, when you're talking to the target cluster. Um, here's the name and here's the certificate data. So this would look a little different than if you were just connecting the cluster with uh, you know, Kubernetes tokens. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, hand it back to Luke for a second to talk about some of our scaling challenges. Uh, thank you, Dave. We'll take a quick look at the Argo components themselves. Uh, given the style of architecture we've uh, chosen, what kind of scaling challenges are we going to run into and what do we want to make sure everyone is just aware of with Argo? Uh, thinking of Argo CD components operating in three phases, uh, the visualize, the apply, um, and the retrieve. Each phase presents scaling challenges to be aware of and tuned for. Our own challenges exist for the many cluster connections and the many GitHub repos we're connected to. An option to extend what uh, David mentioned earlier, we could also even go so far as to have one cluster connection per tenant per cluster. Uh, this is a challenge for future us to be aware of. Um, so these are a collection of uh, all the challenges you might face, uh, given the style of architectures we were looking at. Uh, for the many Git repos or mono repos, we have a, a variety of parallelism or cache processing on the repo server side. Uh, for the many deployed applications or many cluster uh, connections, um, you have those challenges. Likewise, with the large size of uh, data being uh, retrieved from the API that the uh, body of the API itself might uh, grow. Um, and so to solve for these challenges first, we wanna make sure we do thank the Argo community and the Helm chart project. Uh, be sure to check it out. They have uh, already tagged a lot of the out of the box flags and values ready to be set in the chart. Uh, so you have some tuning already available to you. I'm uh, not getting into too much detail here uh, as many of the other talks you might've heard today or we'll still see today. Uh, we'll get into some of these uh, further details, but uh, for our specific challenges, um, for the many Git repos, being aware of all the timeouts um, and your polling and processing, forking, memory usage. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the part of monitoring of our platform to be constantly aware and seeing how Argo is growing and what kind of memory tuning you have to do for all of your infrastructure. Uh, likewise, for the many cluster connections, you have uh, a lot of tuning around the processor uh, 
queues and uh, starting to look at sharding out the replicas of the cluster uh, connections of the um, application controller. Um, and finally, for the API itself, really just watching the memory usage of that. Um, and so finally, we'll discuss some of our lessons learned through uh, all this work that we've done. Um, I'll start off, I guess, with some of them, yeah. Uh, as we continue to investigate how we tune our security and multi-tenancy, uh, we want to continue to lean into the platforms that we are adopting, whether it's AWS or Argo CD. Uh, we're certainly interested in having this conversation with all of you. What ideas do you have for both AWS, AWS IAM, roles, Argo CD, security and multi-tenancy? Um, or where do we think the projects need to go or like where Argo CD needs to go? We certainly have a challenge, for example, of our uh, Argo projects replicating the same security controls that we're managing in AWS IAM. Um, is there, say, any alignment we could get there in some future uh, capabilities or tools? Yeah, and then the next slide was just one thing that we were kind of playing around with, messing with with this AWS IAM model, which is, you know, you, the, the concern I think we have is if someone gets access to the, the to kind of token uh, um, service account that we have now, they essentially have access to every app deployed in Argo CD because we have this, you know, one Argo CD to rule them all, which is not great. Leaning into the AWS, AWS IAM model is better. It's using more native concepts, but it's still, you know, you get access to, to Argo in our ops cluster, you have access to everything. So we've been thinking, like, is it better to do roles per tenant and then kind of register, register those within our, uh, in our Argo cluster as individual target clusters per tenant? At least then, you know, kind of have separation. But that doesn't really change the, the Argo access model. Argo itself still has access to all those, those tenant spaces. So we've just been trying to toy with some of these ideas and see if there's any, you know, kind of more individualized, secure way we could um, make this so that the tenant stuff is tied more to Git and there's a you know, full life cycle of uh, CI and CD per tenant. Uh, and I think that's it. Uh, thanks, everybody. And two other talks that we've been mentioning. So we had a talk from a colleague this morning at CiliumCon about more about our runtime environment and um, use how we're using Cilium. And then we have a talk later on Thursday uh, about OPA and how we're using a policy to control some of our CI process and who can deploy into Argo and, and when. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have time for maybe one question. Questions? <laughs> oh, one right here. What's today's wordle? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Um, sorry. My question is related about the. I see you are using a one cluster with multiple tenants. Uh, what What is the? How do you define? Uh, or how do you define the tenants? I don't know, a specific namespace or multiple namespaces belong to one tenant, or how do you define this? So, yeah, like for me, from the like if you ignore Argo for a second, a tenant is a namespace, but we do have a concept that we're allowing tenants to create multiple namespaces, but there's some controls on top of that because we don't want, we don't give the tenants the ability to create namespace, namespaces themselves. So we've kind of, we wrote an operator that gives them limited permissions to make new namespaces if they want to. Um, and then if you look at it from the Argo perspective, how we're managing that is we consider like a team or a tenant, like a one-to-one -one mapping with their, their like AWS or their cloud account. So, you know, they get out of the box a namespace that maps back to their cloud account. They can deploy multiple apps into that, but they do have the ability to kind of create sub, sub namespaces if they want to. And it's one, one Argo project per tenant, um, and then that maps to basically prefixed okay. namespaces with their tenant name. Um, okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Give a clap. <laughs>